Gus Abner on. Today is a, a fun day uh, in my life that uh, Catherine originated this concept. I'd like to start it off with acknowledgement to my children, how much they contributed to my well-being and the achievements in my life would not have happened without them. That includes Karna, Eric, Melissa, and the later on adopted Christian Moore. And so Catherine and Nan played a significant role in my achievements in life. And Nan, I was with her for 25 years in the first marriage. Catherine, we're still building on that with 32 or 33 years plus four years of dating. So quite significant that uh, she's still there encouraging me along, keeping me abreast of things. So I appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you very much. So with that, I may exclude you or not include you in certain parts of the life story here. But thank you again for everything you've done for me in my lifetime. With soccer, as we're going along with our kids, and Eric was five years of age, and he was very active, and so he wanted to play soccer. We signed him up for a team, and lo and behold, in those days, soccer was not popular. It was Little League, baseball, and also popcorn and football. Those were the popular sports. We didn't have playing fields. We didn't have coaches or referees. I ended up being the coach of Eric's first endeavor. And I didn't know soccer ball was all about round ball, square ball, fullback, midfielder, strikers, none of those things. That's a new terminology to me, got involved. In the first year, I was not very successful. In the second year, after going to a number of coaching clinics and watching a number of other games, we became pretty successful. Later on, I became coach of a club team also, along with ASO. But we had to go to city councils and to school boards to get permission to play soccer on fields that had been reserved for Little League and Pop Warner football. Reluctantly, they gave us permission to play, gave us time frames. We had to go and mark the fields with chalk. We had to learn how to put up the nets properly, and we had to take everything down so it wouldn't infringe upon Little League or Pop Warner when we concluded our games on the weekend. And that's how I got started in it. Very successful in coaching, up to the state level competition, so forth. In the first railroad merger, there were five commissioners on the Interstate Commerce Commission when I arrived in 1994. In early 95, we approved the merger of Southern Pacific and Union Pacific, which covered approximately 25 states throughout the West. One of the roles I played in that and discussion, the amount of freight that the railroad was carried coming from the ports and also going from the Grain Belt states to the ports. I didn't realize that my traffic was going by rail. And so it was quite significant. Then the following year, we had Burlington Northern Santa Fe. And so I was more involved in that since I understood the concept of what was going on. And plus I had staff, had plenty of research people within the Interstate Commerce News to look at all the things that were impacted. Not only was grain impacted, and also the shipping of things from the ports. 
I joined the ICC in 1994 and then I moved on in 95. We culminated the merger of Union Pacific and Southern Pacific. And in that, that covered approximately 25 states, give or take a little bit there. And it carried all of the freight from the West Coast, including the Long Beach Los Angeles port, which represents over 30% of the international trade. Then you had done and also Southern California and San Diego, which is far less, and also uh, in San Francisco area, there was a certain amount of traffic there. But it was significant in the amount of traffic that was going back and forth there between the Midwest and the West Coast. But just understanding that, with all of the information was given to us by the staff of the Interstate Commerce Commission. You had staff, small offices, that had devoted their life to transportation, and some of them had PhDs in different fields of endeavor, economics, whatever it might be, in transportation. In some ways, I was pretty much a neophyte in the railroad mergers and what a role would be. But it turned out that uh, out of the five commissioners on the ICC at that time, I was the only one there with business experience that assigned the front side of the payroll check. And also, I was the only one that would really speak out on behalf of the businessman. And that could be the farmer, or the shipper. Later on I became co-chairman of the Shipping Council and also of the Grain Cart Council. I got quite an insight in that. The first one, Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, covered about 25 states, give or take, to realize how much of an impact it made upon local communities and the rail lines. And we were governed by the fact that if there was not enough traffic on those tracks, then we were obligated by law to remove the tracks or to abandon the rail line in those areas. So when we did that, and we had to abandon rail lines that serve an agricultural community, such as cotton mills, places like this where they ship large quantities of cotton, that meant the trucking industry had to pick up the slack and haul those bales of cotton from the cotton fields all the way into a larger, but made quite an impact. Later on, this, I became aware of the communities where you had to abandon the rail line that created a prop, those mills, in those little towns because the farmers no longer came there and so the trucks take take the product further away to a rail terminal. A lot of towns were abandoned along the way and that had a major economical impact in towns in Texas, Nebraska, Kansas, even Muskogee, Oklahoma, was impacted by the fact that no longer was a rail terminal there for loading boxcars with freight or grain, grain cars with grain. You had to go to a larger shipping terminal, a rail terminal as such, and that became more apparent in future railroad mergers. The first one, 1995, the second one was Sherman and Northern Santa Fe. The second one, that was six to seven billion dollar merger. And the third one had a greater impact on the eastern seaboard. That split up of Conrail, that covered approximately 25 states again. And that impacted Norfolk Southern, 
which was one of the survivors of that, and CSX. And they split all of the rail lines that Conrail had been running. We had senators and governors come before our commission asking or imploring us not to change certain terminals in their states or impact different areas. Senator Javits, a Republican out of uh, New York, volunteered that he would cut our budget so we couldn't operate as the ICC. And the other one was Congressman Adler. He came before us and threatened to terminate our budget. Also, if we impacted New York, New Jersey, and then the governor of Utah, Levitt, came before a committee. Well, that was on the Union Pacific, Southern Pacific, and the uh, Burton North of Santa Fe. He wanted to impose a tariff on the railroads for crossing their state lines, hauling freight through their state, that they wanted a half percent tariff on all of the freight that crossed their state. And I reminded Governor Levitt that he had appeared before the Lincoln Club when I was chairman of the Lincoln Club. He was telling us what a tax saver he was, how much of a conservative he was, and now here you're asking to us to impose taxes on the shippers coming from ports and from coming from the grain belt. Railroad mergers, uh, the fact that it impacted so many industries, Dow Chemical with two huge plants on the Mississippi River that generate just millions of tons of pellets. And pellets are the things that make your computers, your cars, your bumpers, your grill, your dashboard, garden hose, you name it. Everything you touch almost has a petroleum element. When people talk about getting rid of petroleum products, they really don't realize that that does it. But when we had the railroad merger, they did not, uh, the union contracts and the railroad contracts could not merge. And so it tied up the railroads. They couldn't make a decision about which engineer was to operate the train or at what time. And the computers could not talk to each other. So it hampered rail traffic throughout the nation. The railroads were full lane, full trains, loaded grain products, or petroleum products, or stuff from the ports would be sitting on a railing someplace on the desert because the engineer's time had run out and they had to get another engineer out there and occasioned bring him in by helicopter or by suburban. Major problem with the mergers. Benefit Amtrak, they were loss of income from passenger travel. So we made provisions that they could haul lighter goods from Florida to New York, to New Orleans, back and forth. Those areas and all would benefit Amtrak if they could haul beer, if they could haul bananas, or tropical fruits coming in, or grain coming in to those ports. So that was another thing that we did during the merger process that benefit Amtrak, but the unions had such a bottleneck, there was no way you could solve that problem. Too many unions involved, it was quite a contrast. It was, but for a businessman, I could ask those questions and make those statements. No other commissioner ever spoke up in behalf of business. And the final analysis that was my downfall when Vice President Gore and Teamsters Union 
and a couple of the other unions came out against me after serving on the ICC that I was too business oriented. Fascinating with Bob Doe was a long time friend. Howard Baker was an acquaintance that I met in the political arena. I knew him, but not like I did with Bob Doe. Bob Doe was very special. When he came to the West Coast, I would make provisions if he needed transportation, a limousine, or just a driver, or if he needed an airplane, or in the case of Howard Baker, when he was running for president, good friend Jimmy Beard loaned his plane to him. I flew along a couple of those trips. In those days, we could provide transportation. Nowadays, there'd be a lot of restrictions on how to report and be out in the public about life. In those days, it was not that way. The thing about Cy Fleur, also my being a, a staff man for the Republican Party, made acquaintances with a number of people along that line. But Cy was very special that he make available his computers to me on the weekends or at night when they weren't using them. And he also volunteered that any Republican staffer that wanted to assist, or anybody that wanted to assist in my endeavor, that they can make themselves available to me as far as programming and so forth and how to operate the computers and the printers because I was a neophyte in that area. I was able to print precinct walk sheets for our central committees, Los Angeles, San Diego, Orange County, wherever they needed, Riverside County. I could get the tapes from the different cities and I could run those tapes, but primarily it was focused in Orange County. I would go and uh, spend the night at the Fleur Corporation or at Beckman Instruments or at Allegan Pharmaceutical and I would be able to go in take a sleeping cot with me and some food and take the paper for the precinct watch sheets or take the labels for the printing for mailings. Quite a benefit to people running for the state senate or later on when they were running for federal office. I could assist in those endeavors or running for the assembly and also the central committees could use the precinct uh, walk sheets for precinct work, but an assignment to get free mailing labels, and the volunteers in would take those labels, put them on envelopes or on mailers, and put them in the mail. Tremendous asset for Senator Murphy and different ones. Kind of made me the fair-haired guy in Republican politics because nobody else was doing it at that time. And so with that, I was delegated to go and represent Orange County and speak on his behalf if he couldn't attend because he was a practicing attorney in real life and still had to make a, a living for his family also. It's great, I got appointed with Ray Bliss. He appointed me to head up a data processing committee for the nation. And uh, along that line, nominated Senator John Tower of Texas to be on my committee, Senator Dominic of Colorado. Also a guy by the name of Barry Goldwater. And then uh, Congressman Bob Wilson from San Diego, who was chairman of the Congressional Campaign Committee for the Nation. That was my staff. Basically those people were honorary in nature. That was powerful forces though. If I get a, one of the senators, or Barry Goldwater, or Bob Wilson to make a call, I could open any door any place. It was fascinating. And with that, later on, we had a meeting in Hawaii. And uh, I think there were five of us, maybe six of us total, and uh, including those names. And I think those guys went for the fact that uh, 
take out of a little vacation away from Washington, Washington D.C. Gave them an opportunity all. They were all poker players. They could have a poker game. And uh, Center Tower always loved to have a little bit of Jack Daniels. And obviously loved to have some beautiful young thing standing there with high heel shoes on to fetch his drinks for him. That was, that was a, an incredible trip. I heard some of the jokes. I had forgotten them, but they were pretty raunchy. Leonard Firestone, also an impact and a, and a contributor. He didn't have anything in the Orange County in a physical way, but his name alone was very helpful. And just the fact that I was able to talk to people like this, and if I needed to, like a call, they would make a telephone call for me. Doors were automatically open. David Packard was another one, and those people were not interested in Gus Owen as such. David Packard, on two occasions, I met with him. It was social in nature. He was more interested in my job. How did I run campaigns? What was I doing out there? How did I get all these people together? and his questions along those lines. And I think also Cy Fleur and uh, Leonard Firestone. I think a lot of these people were interested. How do you put together an organization, a campaign organization? What do you do? And in those days, you go places with paper bags of money. You didn't have to report to anybody except to the people you got the money from. Like, if I got money from the Congressional Campaign Committee to go into Montana, I could take their social security number of the person that was doing the precinct work and their signature. And that was all that was required. Put down the amount of money that you gave them, what they were doing, social security number, and that was sufficient in those days. And it was amazing. They knew that in different states when you flew in. If Walter Knott threw Frank White his right arm, they would give me so much money for party conventions to rent a suite to entertain people. And when you flew into states, you had those same bags of money. Go and do those things. It was a fascinating time. And the trustworthiness they had of their staff, there were four of us on the Congressional Campaign Committee for the entire nation at the time. Eddie Mai was a dear friend. He's passed away by now. The ICC appointment occurred the beginning started in Newport Beach at a hotel where Bob Dole was staying and Gavin Herbert, the CEO and principal owner of Allergan Pharmaceutical, also had donated their computers and their staff, which is just outstanding to all of my endeavors whichever it was with the Congressional Campaign, Campaign Committee, state apparatus, or the Cal Plan, whichever program I was working on. We had a breakfast meeting, Gavin Herbert, Senator Doe, and myself. And during a discussion, it came up whether the Senator asked me what I was doing and. I told them I was doing a lot of fishing and hunting. I tried to retire and I was too, too boring. I couldn't do that. But I told them that I was being complaining about what was going on in Washington for a number of years. I'd like to know what's going on back there. And with that, Gavin Herbert chimed in and said, why don't you get an appointment to one of the commissioners back there? 
And so Senator Jones said, what would you like to do? Whatever you'd want to do, said, let me know and I put your name forth. And Gavin recommended the ICC, said he knew more about Washington because they had staff people there that represented their firm. And then later on they merged with Smith Klein or took it over. I told Bob Dole I'd go for the ICC. He told me I could go for our Federal Communication Commission, any of the commission, anyone that I wanted. If there was vacancy, he would put my name for it. And so it ended up ICC. I got the paperwork in, and I went back for my final meeting with Senator Dole before I started the rounds with all of the senators and congressional leaders on uh, getting the appointment. You have to go through that process. I was going over for my appointment with Senator Doe, and as I walked over the Capitol Police, I had everything pretty much sealed off around the Rayburn Building, Senate Building, and just the whole general area. I did not know that uh, Senator Doe had a meeting first that morning with President Clinton and the Hillary discussing Hillary's health care plan and basically telling me he's going to reject it. Then the following meeting I went over and met with Senator Beautiful Chambers and met with him and we visited and talked about things. He was telling me about the process that I would go through. With that I left and as I leaving, the Capitol Police was far more active. They were all over the place. And I asked what was going on. President Mubarak was meeting with Senator Dodeau next after I left. So I got back to the hotel and I called the captain. I said, I am really in tall water because I'm meeting with the President of the Senate after he's met with the President and Hillary. And then the next meeting he's having with President Mubarak. And they put me in between those two. I said, that's incredible that a guy by the name of Gus Owen would be sitting in between the President of the United States and the President of Egypt. At this time, I said, it just blows me away. They would think that much of me and disappointment. That's the start of it. Feinstein, Boxer, uh, McCain, all the way down the line, and can't think of his name now, Congressman, a Japanese Congressman, that was uh, from the Modesto, California. He was uh, housed at the Fisher's War Camp. That was interesting that at uh, one of our trips, the Owen family went to pick grapes and uh, things like that during the harvest season to make enough money to pay rent on our home in Muskogee. They moved the prisoners of war from the Japanese detention centers to Wyoming to another detention center because the Japanese supposedly were going to invade California before the end of the war. One of my cousins happened to be there also. He had a bicycle and it shows a picture of me sitting on the handlebars of Bobby's bicycle. It showed pictures of the tar paper shacks, buildings, and back of it. There's a board camp. I had that picture for some reason. I'd gotten it, I don't know how. And when I went in to see this congressman, I'll get his name, it'll come back to me. I showed him the picture when I walk in. When you walk into a, a meeting like that with a senator or a congressman, it just won't be the congressman or the senator. They'll have three or four staff members that are tuned to transportation issues. And they will have questions that they will pose to me. 
when I walked into the congressman's office and I asked him if I could have a moment before we started with the question of CCR. I walked over to him and showed him the picture. I had blown it up to a five by seven. He said, oh my God. That's where he had stayed with his family during the war. And now they were allowing the poor, poor white trash from Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas to stay there now instead of sleeping in the fields. Later on, the story with him was he and I became good friends, and he became good friends with the senator of Wyoming, a Boy Scout troop in Wyoming, befriended the Boy Scouts and the prisoner of war camp and he was one of the Boy Scouts. He was a great guy. He had been to our Lincoln Club also. But he had been there. That was fascinating how things go in life, such as a senator from Utah, prominent Mormon, befriended Bobby Kennedy after the drowning of Pukaputnik. He walked Bobby Kennedy through rehabilitation. Over the years, they became good friends. Being active in California, Bill Honig, his wife was a good friend, uh, Nancy Honig, and then General Lyon was very active with Bill Honig, and his wife was a good friend also, uh, Catherine. And both of them were good friends of Catherine more so mine, than mine. They knew that Catherine had been single for many years, raising her daughter, Kristen, and that I was a single guy now. They always liked to help do the matchmaking. I don't know why women are so possessed with that skill. Nancy and, and Willa Dean connived to have Kath and I seated next to each other at the head table for Bill Honig at a fundraiser in Orange County. We sat and chatted during dinner and so forth. And then afterwards, I know I mentioned something about the getting together for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine sometime. And I made the overture to get together at that time because I really didn't know Catherine other than the fact that I'd seen her. I knew that she bought a lot of tickets for a Rams game to make it a sellout so that the Orange County residents could see the football game because of blacked out in Orange County. And she would do things like she was on the Olympic Committee and so she and her daughter Kristen went to that and I was in the newspaper also. I had probably met her maybe once or twice. Never really knew her. Just a beautiful fashion plate. And I didn't know she had a big, big company. I knew she had a company. So anyway, that's how this started. And on her first day, she would come down to San Juan Capistrano. And I had an apartment in Laguna Beach. Forgot she would come by and pick me up because I think she wanted to make certain she had a getaway car because <laughs> she didn't like the date. Catherine shows up, she's dressed beautifully and Gus comes to the door to go get in the car with her. I have Levi's, cargo boots, dressed like that and so and I had made the reservation a little restaurant I helped, uh, helped them get their lease in this little Italian restaurant fantastic food later on I helped them get a lease in Dana Park Harbor and it was still there now and it's sold out now to a larger firm we got there early when we 
I'll have a drink someplace. The Swallows Inn is a cowboy place where on occasion people come in with their horse at the bar. And it's that type, wooden floor, peanut shells on the floor. We go in to have a drink. Here she is dressed just beautifully. And me, cup of, so we walk in. I, I think I ordered uh, tequila or something. Or, and she was kind of shell-shocked in being this place because a lot of cowboys were in there from, from the ranch. That was their hangout. And the sheriff might have been in there. It was his hangout too. She was kind of like, whatever you have, I'll have one too. <laughs> so that was our first date. And then uh, we had our drink and by then the restaurant opened at 6.30. We went down and had a great dinner and she went home and we started dating after that. And that went on for four years approximately. And she calls one day and uh, said I want you to to grab a sports jacket and a pair of slacks and I'll come by and pick you up and we'll go to San Diego at a hotel. She came by and picked me up and uh, we went to the hotel, San Diego and uh, with the island there, shelter right on the bottom and where the seals are baked. We go down there and check into the hotel and go into the room and walk into the room. There's flowers, there's some hors d'oeuvres. She pours me a glass of wine or a glass of champagne. She sat down one chair across the room and I sat down on the other chair across the room and she started talking about where is this relationship going to after four years. And I said, I don't know. I said, why don't we just get married? <laughs> so that's how this came about. She jumped my lap and about a week later we flew back to Muskogee. She shared an airplane with Leo Cook at the time. And I called both my daughters, Karna and Melissa, and asked them to join us so we go back to her mom's birthday. It was my mom's birthday anyway. They thought something was up and they met us at Long Beach at the hangar. We stopped in Dallas to pick up wedding dresses for the girls, then flew on to Muskogee, had a reservation at a bed and breakfast place, and got married. Invited the family in from the farms. That was quite the wedding. My uncle Vernon took Catherine out of the porch step later on to explain all about the birds and bees. Pete elected the assembly. Then he ran for mayor of San Diego after he, and then he ran for governor. I helped him in every endeavor and been a personal friend for many years. He was a captain of the Marine Corps. I was a private. On that note, later on I had at a Lincoln Club function had the Commandant of the Marine Corps be your guest speaker. And the oldest Marine in the room, Dr. Beckman, joined when he was 17. When the First War came back, the little girls served him donuts along and coffee when they embarked on their trip to the First War. Mm -hmm. And he asked permission for Mother if it's okay to write her daughter. And he had never met her before. He didn't have anybody to write to. So he wrote to Mabel 
They got married, were married for, for 65 years. And she died. Just a beautiful story. He was a personal friend. Well, back to Pete. Later on, he appointed me the Fish and Game Commission. He's the guy that when the Spotted Owl fiasco was going on and the Mojave Ground Squirrel, all of that, I was right in the midst of that. For my first day, school children were bussed in to beg us to keep the logging mills open so their fathers would have a job. At the conclusion, of our first day's meeting and we informed them we would have to close the mills because it's spotted out. I called the governor's office to see if he was in. He was in working with his budget committee and his secretary slipped him a note and he said he'd break from the meeting and meet with me. So I walked across to the governor's office and I walked in and Pete was sitting behind his desk and I walked in and I said, you son of a bitch, don't ever do that to me again. I said, to listen to those kids begging for their jobs, their father's jobs, and I had to close the town down to the mill down, which in essence closed the logging mill down. Speed. I said, that's awful. He said, you're having to do what I've had to do all along. He said, those decisions are hard to make. He said, you have to make them. And I've seen Pete since then. I happened to get on the train once flying out to check on my apartments from here. Got on the train to San Diego. I'd go up to Oceanside, get off the train get a cab to go to the apartment. I kept an apartment there, plus my suburban. Then I got on, a, as I walked by, some of the people on the train. I thought this guy looked for me, and I walked up, and I got my seat and had my glass of wine. Brought up to me, they bring a bottle of wine up to you. Bring that, so I get it, I'm sitting there looking, I look back there. And the, focused in on him. It was Pete. So I walked back and said hello. Sat down, chatted with him. Went back, got my st stuff. And uh, when we got off, he uh, took me along with him. The state police guy was there. He knows he retired as governor. And he offered me a ride out in the golf cart to my taxi. I get my taxi to go. He goes, no, I was going up to see Melissa at that time. That's when it was. Yeah. A long time ago. Me and Gail still live in Pasadena. And Duke still lives in uh, Long Beach. I said, I still have their home phone numbers. And I called Duke not too long ago and chatted with him. I was privileged to put together the Citizen Reagan's first rally in Santa Ana, tail end of 1965, 66. It should be in the newspapers, and I just haven't uh, looked it up or dug up the article, the actual date on it. Unfortunately, that calendar has been lost someplace in all of the years. I put that on, I had buses bringing people from Leisure World, also had the Federated Women and the Active Young Republicans and different volunteer groups rounding up people. Had a few thousand people there. It was a pretty good sized crowd giving away a color television. It's a door prize. This nice sunny day. My Master of Ceremonies was Andy Devine, and I typed up his script. Also, Carl Karcher was to give the invocation. Andy Devine couldn't read the script, 
So I end up have to go up to the stage and help him along. Carl Karcher forgot his reading glasses, so he couldn't read. In the invocation, I'd go up and read a prayer from a, it's St. Francis prayer, prayer that he carries with him all the time. The car gave away the prize that day. You had to be present to get the color television. If somebody wanted, first number call wasn't there. We gave away the prize to the person that was there. Lo and behold, come Sunday, Marge Fleur, Sai's wife, wrote down the number and called the friend in San Diego. And the friend had that number. I had to call Sai. He said, Gus, he said, go buy one and give it away. He said, keep peace in the family. <laughs> so I bought another television set for Marge's friend on Palm Springs. Couldn't believe it. But that was interesting. That was fascinating. I had no idea that first of all there were jobs in politics. I was working at as a clerk at Market Basket in charge of the liquor and the drug section. And that was my job. And I was going to go up in the ranks there, maybe. The union there really was upset with me because I was supporting Goldwater. And they were adamant, they opposed to Goldwater. When I wanted to find out what the Republican Party was all about, was Nan's father was a strong conservative, Swede, very staunch conservative. We had been Democrats all of our life. In Oklahoma, that's what you were, was a lifelong Democrat. I thought, find out about the Republican Party. I called Young Republicans, and Dick Reddick was president of Young Republicans at that time in Orange County. So he agreed to meet with Nan and I and Donna McAlpin, a good friend of Nan's. So we met on Saturday. Dick Reddick didn't have a chapter, a young, young Republican chapter in Newport, Coastal Mesa area. But at the conclusion of the meeting, I was now the president of the new chapter in Coastal Mesa. You know, Newport Beach, and from there I had to figure out what to do on it. Dick helped as much as he could, so we found a place for a meeting above the High Time Liquor Store on 17th Street in Newport Beach. We were able to use a ballroom upstairs on Saturday nights, and so that's what we did. We had a meeting, had a few people show up, friends, so forth, and the idea was that we could buy beer and wine and have a little social gathering after the meeting. Our first meeting we probably had, if I remember correctly, a, sim a city councilman later on to become assemblyman, Robert Badham. We had him come and speak and next we had a social gathering. People could have a beer or a glass of wine put a record player on and play some music, dance if you wanted to, hardwood floor. So sure enough, in six months time, we had about 300 members. Just bloomed, it was political season for Goldwater and all of this. So that's how it, that happened. And Denny Carpenter's secretary, beautiful young lady, was one of our members and she told me that her boss was looking for somebody to work as the executive secretary of the Republican Central Committee. So I didn't apply. Danny Carpenter called me and wanted me to come down and meet with him. Popped on my bicycle and probably walking short in sandals, rode up to his law office and I think it might have been Saturday or Sunday. Met with him and he offered me the job. $800 a month plus expense account. God, I thought that's fantastic. I 
took the job. And from there, all of these things evolved. The two guys that were with IBM volunteered to help me. And then the computers were volunteered. Then I was the guy that would work weekends or nights. And Nan would take care of her three kids. And she was very supportive of me doing that. She was a, very much a diehard Goldwater. And the timing that I was able to put together those labels and precinct walk sheets and create a reputation within a year's time where Bob Beaver and Cy Fleur, Walter Knott couldn't believe here's a young guy that work weekends, nine day walk precincts, go talk to groups, get them organized, attorney groups, real estate groups, whatever. Appoint people, your chairman, Denny, Denny Carpenter would be chairman of Calpland for the state of California. So that gave me the credential to go to Riverside, San Bernardino, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, wherever, and have organize. And big state, and you get to know of Phil Graham, all of these people at, at a personal level. God has been good to me, but the timing wouldn't have been worth that crap if you were working 40 hour work week. A lot of people would have taken the job, would have not budged out of the office. The fact that I would go and get people to donate computers or trucks. And then from the other part of the story is that we had a little office on South Grand in Santa Ana. And I knew we needed more space for our meetings. So the warehouse down the street on South Grand. I saw that as 4,500 square feet from 1,000 square feet or 1,200 square feet to 4,500. Then Don Cole was a volunteer pilot up and out the state for Denny and I. Denny was his part through the construction and other contractors provided the lumber and drywall. And then Louis Smatter who Catherine worked for, and I didn't know at the time. Later on, we found out she worked for Louis Metzger. They volunteered the air conditioning for 4,500 square feet. And then the Federated Women donated $6,500, $7,000. Three color printing press. And Garden Bishop, who orange, owned Orange Groves, took time off to be our precinct chairman and come in. And then I put together a boiler shop that would work nights. And federated women would take turns volunteering nights. Come in and put labels on for precincts, for assemblymen, for state senators. Ah. So I had a workforce. I put on dinner for a guy by the name of Dick Nixon. Alex Robertson was my chairman of Bellier. I think he owned Bellier. He owned a large construction company. So 1,100 people showed up at the Anaheim Convention Center for that. And volunteer women seated all those people had the tables organized to see them all. Ah, to organize all of those volunteers and to bring that together. When I think about uh, charitable things, I think about, you know, I've done things with different organizations, Salvation Army, Goodwill, and so forth. But I think the charitable organization should start with soccer. When I think about the hours, the contributions you make and 
it may be self-serving with your own children, but with all of the other children, the thousands of kids that we impacted, lecturing people uh, on how to conduct themselves at games, at sporting events, reminding parents that it's not for them, it's for the child. When parents get overly involved, get overly excited about a game, then it's wrong. You let the kids play, boys or girls, and that is a major contribution that all of that effort, even the effort with the World Cup, and I was just a lesser role there. I was not a major figure. Other people were, but it did make a contribution. Beneficial to see the Rose Bowl filled up with thousands of people. Finally, we got the World Cup here in 94. Seems so long ago, you know, to think that uh, thousands of people and remember meeting Robert Kraft. He was a young man in those days. Now with the Boston Patriots, stuff like that. It's, uh, I was on the site selection committee and benefited in that participation. We did an awful lot of the work out of California. The organization really folks more in Los Angeles than any place else. Surf boards were very popular with, with the long board, but then as the smaller boards came into play, you had to be quite an athlete to master the skills with the surfboards in. Also had an outrigger for a while. For a kid to, from Oklahoma that was dog paddling, all of a sudden become body surfing, board surfing, skin diving, free diving, and to be an excellent swimmer, and to live in the water for hours and hours at a time down in Mexico in different places, or in the Caribbean even, to dive, to hit 45 feet, and to dive my greatest depth was a 65 foot dive, and a free dive without tanks. But we had other people to dive deeper. To go down for big fish, you had to be down in the 30 to 40 foot range. It's a major love that uh, make our own spear guns and the wetsuits to cut them out, measure our body, cut them out, glue them together, and you put them on with cornstarch. Just, you know, how you do this thing. You can go out and live in the water. So, 1961, married Nan, met her junior college, George Coast Junior College. We had a very good marriage for a number of years. And then I think, due to my outside activities and so forth, and participation things, that uh, probably drifted away from the marriage to some degree. I was so active at so many things. Nan went in another direction with more of the art and so forth in Laguna Beach School of Art. And I regret the breakup of the marriage. It's wrong any marriage to dissolve in a divorce. Three beautiful children and had a very successful life for a number of years. Traveled to Europe. The kids are well informed about traveling, know their way around. So I felt good about that. Going from uh, being married to Nan and being active there in the political arena, in the soccer arena, and then from marrying Catherine and even dating her was an evolution there in itself. Going from khaki trousers, one sport coat, and, and one suit or something like that. I was never involved in something where all of a sudden you had 
three zero nights a week, something like this. Then you had to have suits to go to a lot of the meetings. And plus I elevated myself to go to more events where I had to have more suits and things of that nature. But with Catherine, all of a sudden you're out there with somebody is in the limelight. When she goes to events, people pay attention, they take pictures. And then who's the guy with her? That had to change. It did change. And so it was beneficial in a lot of ways. I met Pete Conrad and uh, Buzz Auburn, both through Catherine and through Jimmy Beard on Pete Conrad. Met them socially. Later on with Pete Conrad, we saw more of him than we did, well, it was Buzz, they were around all the time, also in the charitable event. Anytime you were at a charitable event and they were there, then Catherine would be with them also. Hitchhiking to California when I left home, I was disgruntled in some ways with home life. We are poor and struggling along, and I knew there were jobs in California. So I decided to go to California by myself, 15 cents in my pocket, and got the rail to ride through Dad's ability to use a rail pass back in Muskogee. I could ride the train from Muskogee to Dallas. Once you get to Dallas, then I was on my own again, hitchhiking there. So I was standing on the highway, skinny little kid, and I bought some fake noodles with my 15 cents. That was my dinner, lunch, breakfast. So I hitchhiked from there out in Amarillo or Albuquerque, I'm not certain which city it was. I ended up there, the, the police picked up hitchhikers because hitchhikers were known to be committing all, all of the burglaries in the town. So they would always pick them up and grill them. And then the conclusion of grilling, if they figured you were safe, they would take you to the outskirts of town because water is pretty precious in those communities in those days. So they'd drop you off on the highway out there and on one occasion, I know it was quite cold. I rolled up and got some newspapers, used those as cover, and laid down the ditch to stay out of the wind, because the wind coming across the prairies just cut right through you. Another time, I used a cardboard box. You sheltered from the wind. Well, I got the first ride, I think, was a trucker. And then I got another ride with a guy from a fellow who looked like a mobster from Chicago and a Pontiac Firebird or something like that. He bought me a hamburger at a restaurant, a little diner-like place. As we're eating and everything, he takes the opportunity to turn spit on the floor. The lady behind the counter got mad and got upset with him, kicked us out of there with their hamburger. So we went back, got in our car, and drove on down the road to work California. I've forgotten where he dropped me off, but I end up in Azusa, California. And so I knew that it was cold there. It's a damp cold when you get closer to the coast. I went into an orange grove, and curled up close to a smudge pot. Smudge pot, he lit those at night to keep the oranges from freezing. I survived for about three days. Police would come looking for you, and they'd shine flashlights underneath the trees, trying to locate this. They didn't know who I was or anything. They knew somebody was in the orange grove. Evidently, I'd been reported by somebody. And so I got odd jobs there at a service station, doing anything to help clean up and got enough money eventually to rent a room, boarding room, where you'd get uh, 
housing, you know, a bed to sleep in, they'd pack a lunch at, for you in the morning, feed you breakfast, you come back that evening, to the end of the week, when you got paid, you paid up $18 or, I don't know how I survived doing all of that. How I did it, I look back on my life. Some of those days were events like that. You shake your head, you were a skinny little kid. It's fascinating that uh, I did that, and got the jobs, and then I migrated up to Northern California. I had some cousins up there in Rodeo. They lived in the Navy housing. That goes to one of the cousins with this uh, prisoner of war camp, Bobby Zachary there, down, I don't know how they got down there, how, how we convened there, but uh, had a couple of uncles up there, Uncle Ben, uh, Uncle Bud. They needed uh, somebody to run the errands for them and stuff, or be the gopher. Uh, they were painters. By being the gopher, that means you haul all the paint. And they got a contract to paint a thin chain link fence around the military base. Quite a lengthy chain link fence. Now, looking at a chain link fence, you stop and look at it and say, there's only so much chain. And there's a lot of open space. To catch the paint that went through the open, open space, they had this young turkey by the name of Gus that held a piece of plywood four feet in width and about six feet tall. They had a metal trough at the bottom of this plywood. They collected all of the paint they missed the fence and drained down the metal trough. And when the metal trough got full of paint, I would take the metal trough, tilt it, dump it into a five gallon paint bucket. It was my job day after day. Since the spray gun is going to word me, I put Vaseline in my hair keep the paint out of my hair and Vaseline on my face and cloths around to protect me as much as possible. And the same clothes I wore every day because paint would collect on a long sleeve shirt and long trousers. And that was my job. And then doing the cleanup thought of that. So that lasted for a while. Then I got a job at uh, Rain Manufacturing on a stamping machine in Richmond. And then from that job, I rented a room from a family. And the father was a, an engineer for Santa Fe Railroad. He recommended me for a job with Santa Fe Railroad. So I went and got that job and I was a switchman for the braking yards where they broke up the trains and assembled trains to go out on the road. I worked out there doing that at night Naturally, you got the graveyard since you were new hire. And we pick up uh, parts of trains, cars loaded at the Oakland uh, terminal, we bring them up to Richmond and to a larger yard and assemble the trains there. When the trains would come in from the road, we would break the trains up and distribute the cars to Oakland. Some would go by barge, which is a fascinating job. I'd be loading barges with train cars on one of my trips to California. Hop the drain, 
one time it pulled off on a side and, and I went down like a siege. There was a fire up there alongside the track down off the track and I walked up to it. I looked down, I don't remember if I went down or if I think I was scared and walked away. Got back on the train and got off in wherever city it was. But I remember catching that and running to catch that boxcar on that particular. And as you jump up and catch the ladder, where do you think your feet would go? Your feet automatically go underneath the car. So a lot of people die along the railroad tracks in those days. Because if you aren't careful, and Bose will tell you, when you grab that ladder, make certain you, with all your strength, you pull your feet up away until you get another climb on the ladder. Pull up, because you have a chance having one foot cut off above the ankle and with the pain you fall off and die. And that's a horrible story about people that died back in those days without anybody ever knowing where they died or how they died. The same thing is true with hitchhiking. At one time in California, I was hitchhiking, homosexual guy, we called queers in those days, was grabbing my leg. And fortunately, he stopped and let me out. Another time in Oklahoma, when I was younger, the guy didn't stop, and I had to jump out and roll in the gravel when I was hitchhiking from McAllister to Savannah. And I had to be about 11 years old or so, or 12. But it was common to hitchhike in those days. It was very interesting when I came back to Oklahoma for the first time after running away. Nobody knew where I'd gone or in those days I didn't pick up the phone and call. Didn't have the money in some cases otherwise. You didn't know what to say to your parents because in those days we never said, I love you. Parents very seldom in our income bracket didn't express love. It was, how do you get food on the table? How do you, how do you get a place to sleep at night? Is that. So when I returned to Muskogee, it's kind of like, don't ever think it's a hero thing or anything like that. It's a novelty thing. Everybody wants to talk to you. What's it like in California? What's it like, you know, everybody thinks you went to Hollywood or you went surfing or you did something. You didn't do any of those things because you didn't have money to, but they were fascinated by it. So when I went back the second time, or the next time with Doug Conley, and we did catch a train there, ended up in the mountains, and we stopped at a place, they had a, pulled off and stopped for a while, the train had, and Doug and I saw this country grocery store, and went up and got some groceries, probably bologna and mayonnaise or whatever bread. As we were paying for it, the train is pulling out. We're running panically to catch a train and we did catch it. In those days they had a caboose on. So we caught the caboose, threw our groceries on, climbed up on it. A brakeman beats us there. He's going to throw us off. But we plead the case and he lets us stay on board and have our lunch in the caboose. But we had to get off 
at the next stop. So the next time we stopped, Doug and I had to round up our cardboard suitcases and get off the train. I don't know if that was needles or if we hitchhiked into it. I don't call that. But then we got into needles and we were having lunch there in a the park. And the police came along and naturally they picked you up because we had been stealing everything and burglarizing all the homes, so they could. but they couldn't pin anything on us, so they put us in jail, got our dinner served that evening, two fried egg sandwiches, and a lemon rain pie. And the next morning we got up, we had two fried egg sandwiches, lemon meringue pie. He took us to the judge, and the judge found out that we had some money. He told us that if we bought our bus tickets and got out of town, he'd let us go. Otherwise, he'd probably send us to jail. We agreed to do that, and we took our money and bought the bus tickets to Richmond, California. That's where Doug and Connie's parents lived. And we stayed with him for a couple of weeks until we earned enough money to get a job, and get an apartment. That's when I got the job, probably at Ream then, I don't know for sure. Or maybe I got the job then in Santa Fe. But I think that's when I ended up calling mom and hanging out with the gang there three other guys that I was getting in trouble. Getting liquor stores, getting booze, stuff like this. Partying with some girls. One of the guys go to prison, so I figured it's time for Gus to get out of here. I called mom, she agreed to let me join the Marine Corps. I hitchhiked back to Oklahoma. Joining the Marine Corps, mom had to get the had to get the birth certificate. And in those days, birth certificates were not given in the wintertime because the doctors couldn't get to the farms. So the doctor had turned it in. He turned it in as J.J. Owen. So mom had to get it corrected to Gus Abner Owen. So we had to get that done first. But didn't take very long. One day, probably, got that corrected. So I got my first airplane ride from Oklahoma City to San Diego. You get off there, go to the Marine Corps barracks in San Diego. You go through a little bit of hell there. The drill instructor had come back from the frozen chosen. He had been one of the few survivors where they stacked corpus on the tanks. Trucks get him out. He survived and he made certain that you understood that when a PFC or a corporal or anybody above you said charge, you charged. You didn't ask questions like they do in the Army or the Air Force, anything else. That is the reason the Marine Corps is what it is today. You do charge and you charge. I walked into this office one evening after we had finished up at Camp Pendleton, going through the live fire, and I had screwed up somehow to bring to his attention. So he called me in that evening as I go in. I'm staying there by the door, a wooden door, and he's throwing a bat at, at me. But it's naturally, it's hitting the door. He's not hitting me. But it scares the shit out of you. That uh, he's want to instill in you the fear that goes with it. That you're in combat. You do not question because everybody else's life 
depends upon you doing what you're told to do. I remember one of our guys suffered a, a bayonet wound or a saber wound while around Camp Penton. And the drill instructor's running with, running with you. Some guy's screwing up, he jams the bayonet, and to trip him, instead of hitting him, he hit his leg. He was trying to trip him, but so they probably put both of them in a little bit of trouble, but uh, it was interesting going through boot camp. And to come to find out by the fate of God that uh, I was chosen for sea duty. And the sea duty comprised of, of being an MP on board ship for the brig and also to serve at the pleasure of the captain of the admiral and to stand at attention for parade rest at their door for two hours or four hour shifts, whatever it was. And on occasion it'd be dress blues, typically khaki, and we had liberty in, in Japan also and in, uh, in Hong Kong, which was quite fascinating there. But uh, the ship was recommissioned in January of 52, and we were the first troops on board and shipping out of Long Beach to Hawaii and then on to Japan and then on to Korea for 13 months patrolling seas and firing the big guns to support the troops on shore. Pretty good duty, but the rest of that platoon went to either combat, could have been martyr school, big guns, we call us rifle, whatever. We were using second-hand material from Second World War. So any equipment, our uniforms, were the same as Second World War. But it's good duty and I was grateful. The Marine Corps taught me discipline, made me what I am today, gave me the guidelines. They brought me forth in toilets. And unlike John Tower being Bosun Magd and then being a senator, or John McCain being a lieutenant, and a, then a POW, and then being a senator. I went the other route, ended up the only ICC. So it's fascinating the journeys we take. And I flew back and forth quite often with John McCain. When you go to the airport, they put us in the holding room, service beverages or whatever. Then we'd be shoved down the cart to the airplane. That's when I had a pass that said I could go in the cockpit. I could go on board any ship, any railroad, any place. And they had the privilege to let me through and to treat me as a VIP especially, I don't know, I just said, uh, I've still got those. When I got back to Korea, it was a board out, Harley Davidson, I forgot what year it was, but uh, it was an older bike, and what we call a bob job, where you had the fingers chopped back a little bit, and I used it for uh, gunning a what, hare and hound type races. Get out of the desert. We could chase around out there on our bikes and do some dumb things. I'll never forget one time that outside of Hawthorne, Nevada, where I was stationed for the last year, my Marine Corps last year and a half. About a year, I guess it was. We were chasing around. Uh, I was roaring up this hill out there in the desert, and I was roaring up to the top of it up there. I was going to, going to go down the other side. 
And on the other side, there wasn't on another side. It was a cliff. So I go flying through the air, crash and land. And that, uh, the bike survived, but I was kind of banged up and everything. Different things happened on the bike. I would ride it back and forth from Southern California to Hawthorne, Nevada on, I don't know, maybe three or four occasions, going all that distance. On one time, I was going across a pretty barren stretch of highway, two-lane highway out there, up around Bishop area. And uh, I hit this curve, and I thought it was a fairly safe curve, but there was sand on the highway. And I didn't, didn't break, didn't see it. And I hit the sand, the bike left, was flying through the air. I go flying through the air. I hit the guardrail. They had those stainless steel guardrails with the wooden spiked up post. I hit that and I landed in the desert close to my bike. And the bike was still running. The tire was still spinning. It was laying on the side. And this couple, older couple, jumped out of their car, came running over, and were pouring a canteen of water in my face. I came to, and my knee was pretty well banged up, left knee, blood all over. He got me up, I had him help me prop the bike up. We got the bike back on the highway and I fired it up. I put my leg up, strapped it up on the left-hand side and rode into Bishop, California. And I got off in Bishop. I was in a state of shock, vibrating, everything. So they called the base, which is over the mountain there. And the base sent an ambulance for me. So they came and got me. I'll be in the hospital a few days, out on a splint. And the doctor told me not to ride the bike for at least six weeks or so. Well, the following weekend, I decided to ride the bike into town. And so I got on the bike, went into town, had a few beers. So I was giving a buddy a ride back to the base on the back of my bike. We came out, the car pulled out in front of us. So I threw it into a skid, slid off in the ditch. So back in the hospital, commanding officer, everybody got involved then, restricted me to the base. No riding for a while. But anyway, I kept the bike. Kept riding it just so. I was pretty foolish, pretty headstrong. And as I got down to the turn, I was a model marine that my picture had been taken as a PFC going to be promoted to corporal and all of that going on and I just screwed up. I started going and going to town more and the major's wife was in there one night. They had a spat. And I was babysitting their kids at times. I'd also been running the rec hall and so forth. Mom and Marie did take my picture. It was in the Marine Corps Bible on how to dress. They were in the spat. Major came in and started arguing. So and I intervened and between the wife and, and the husband, and I was wrong. So I shoved the major. And so that was bad. So I ended up with the brig overnight. That was kind of the, the Harley Davidson story. I was a little bit too carried away. Costa Mesa I was the president of the Young Republicans, being precinct chairman for Goldwater in 64. 
also. D. Carpenter was chairman of the Republican Party at the time he gave me the job of executive secretary, where I started the role there. Walter Nott was on my executive committee that met every Wednesday. He was a beautiful guy. He loved to cross the picket line that Cesar Chavez had around their food stand and stuff like that, or the food stand somebody else owned. He would cross that picket line, 55 Ford Fair Lane, and load up with fruit and vegetables and bring them in and leave them for the volunteers. But I would go over and visit him and uh, Frank White was this right gang guy that uh, conservatives throughout the nation would send Walter Knopp money in envelopes or paper bags and allow him to distribute that throughout the nation or wherever he thought fit. And so Frank had the money and Frank would give me the money to distribute to candidates or to host uh, receptions, state conventions for your rock or for Republican assembly, whatever it might be. And they would give me thousands of dollars to distribute to candidates wherever. Walking the grounds with Walter Knott one time and he would bend over and pick up candy wrappers, stuff like this. So I said to him one day, I said, Mr. Knott, why do you do that? You have all of these mates that work around to do that, pick up and clean up. He said, Gus, he said, if you take care of the little things in life, the big things will take care of themselves. So I use that in speeches throughout the nation. That was one of the things. The other one was uh, Dr. Beckman had made a statement, and I'll try to recall that, but he used both of those in speeches. One time there was roughly 900 people in New Orleans or Atlanta, whichever, this big union gathering. And they invited me to be a guest speaker. Now here I am, a Republican commissioner that they invite. They haven't invited any other commissioner over the years. And I was privileged and honored. Later on, they had the coming over with their headquarters in Washington, D.C. And they take 20 or 30 minutes to send out throughout the nation to their union meetings and with their president. I gave a speech down there, and I gave that speech in reference to take care of the little things, the big things, take care of yourself. I told him about my father being a union member. I just told him also about how the Carpenter's Union shafted him. When he retired, he couldn't work more than six months out of the year because of the arthritis. And they did not his pension from the Carpenter's Union was $28 a month. Dad had been a strong union member all those years. You tell people the story, how he was a union member, a strong union member, a poor guy, but yet you also tell them the truth about how I got a standing ovation from that speech down there. 900 members, couldn't believe it. And then later on the chairman of their union had me come over and tape this meeting. I was the commissioner, Republican bench commissioner, did chastise the union before our board meeting of the ICC where there may be 300 people and attend us from throughout the nation. We'd always attend our meetings. 
and I chastise the railroad, Norfolk Southern, for not having toilets in their locomotives for their engineers. The engineers have to bring their own five gallon bucket to defecate as they're running a train through all of these areas. I think that's the reason the unions did that. Some unions supported me, some the Teams Union did not. The situation in our family, very poor, moving from Chicago, tenant farm, farmers ran into farmland there by growing crops, giving the crops half of it to the owner and half to the tenant farmer. And that's what dad and mom lived on. And a shack with no insulation and the winter farms. I mean, the winter, you put toe sacks or quilts up along the walls for insulation. It was very hard, very difficult. Your food was kept underneath the house. Your potatoes and onions, all of that were dried and shriveled up. And your food was biscuits and gravy, and lard. You talk about sandwiches, it'd be a biscuits with some lard smeared on it. Or whatever, it's a piece of cornbread. Dinner at night might be milk or clabber milk, buttermilk, with cornbread crumbled in it. And you had a smokehouse, where you had a smokehouse, you kept your ham and bacon, when you moved to the city, then you had an ice box with ice that you put in a little hole in the top of the ice box, maybe 10 pounds or 12 pounds of ice. Maybe you kept a cow in the backyard and some chicken for eggs. Mama buy flour based upon the pattern on the flour sack where she could make a skirt or shirt. My shorts to play basketball in Savannah were purple. That material, awful looking. I have a picture someplace made with a ragged t-shirt and purple shorts trying to play basketball. Lucky I knew what a basketball was. God, those were days but you were grateful to be alive. Your entertainment was find a tin can to kick around the yard or an old a wheel hoop that you could roll around and that was your entertainment. Got to get a bicycle. I don't know when I ever got a bicycle. Christmas was maybe a, an orange and an apple with some curly candy and maybe some nuts thrown in with it. But a Christmas gift might be a pair of socks. When I got on the Marine Corps and came home, I brought a buddy with me. It was Christmas time to have, I think, I got a necktie. What would I do with a necktie and a 
Hanlon, Hanlon maybe got a pair of socks to a little house on the highway in Shakota, six miles inland there, I mean, in civilization basically. And from there moving to McAllister, we had a fire there and a home there. Then we moved to Savannah, I'd say 1911. And from there up to Muskogee and to that brick house, little brick house, and then to a house on M Street in Muskogee. And from there, picking crops, California. We could have been picking crops from Savannah. I don't know, recollect there. But it was hard, it was mom and dad didn't know the word love. We know they loved us, but never spoke of love. You were beaten quite frequently with belts or a switch and not uncommon to have purple marks, blue marks, cut through the flesh. And my sister had her buff. But that's why all Dwayne left home, joined the army at 17. I was in combat in Korea. I left home next. Jane couldn't leave home. So she married an older guy, Edsel, and stayed with him all those years. Then Cleet left home. Cleet was in difficult times. Gene left home. Larry, 15 years later after me, was naturally pampered because he was the only child. Everybody else was gone. But it was, it was a hard life, but they taught us, to be honest, they taught us integrity counted. They taught us to be a good Christian, to contribute to charities. We only worked to live. And so I'm grateful for Dad and Mom, all they went through. Dad with third grade education, Mom with fifth grade education. So they had had it rough during their life. Mom and Dad came by wagon from Arkansas. Mom was pregnant. There was no service station, no outhouses. They camped along the road someplace. Uncle Vernon and Annis by wagon four days to come from Arkansas to tenant farms at Warner, and I don't know what happened there, but two years later to move to Mount Zion outside of Shakota, first through the eighth grade, one room schoolhouse. What we spoil everybody with. Those were the days you were grateful to be alive. You're grateful you had parents. They did tell us that there's a God that we love and cherish, that you have to work for everything that you get. So nowadays, you work, you appreciate how much a shirt cost or pants cost. Kids nowadays have no idea, no concept, but we're grateful for each and every item that we get. That was fascinating. The fact that I had the credentials to get that job that Jerry Ford and Lee Potter would see fit to hire me and to go into states and try to help organize 
states for campaigns to do those things. Talk to them about a finance committee to share with them what it's like to put together an attorney's committee or a builder's committee or something along those lines to go into a state and to help them mobilize the forces to recruit volunteers to assign them cities and precincts within that city uh, to do that alone and then to bring in outside money from other states or businesses that would be interested in a senator or congressman being elected. One thing to organize on a state level, but another thing to organize on a national level. A national level, will that congressman be appointed to a particular committee our senator to a particular committee and to what purpose would they be appointed to that? What committees should they strive for? That was interesting. It was good, a great foundation, some states to have senators that would have equal clout to a senator. California. That would be the thing that think the senator from Idaho would have as much cloud as Senator from California or Oregon. Oregon would control the ports and things of that nature to ship the produce or bring in products into the state, into the nation as a whole. I didn't realize what impact that would be, but very good, it's just something that I didn't realize that would have that much influence in different states. As the director of the Western United States, and that varied from time to time according to special elections. If there was a death, or somebody got appointed to a cabinet position, or some other position within government and not that seat, there would be a special election. And that was interesting there. Uh, Jerry Ford was a really a nice guy, low key, low key. He did not want to be president. He wanted to be in the House. He enjoyed working with congressmen and the Senate. And uh, he was just so normal, so easy to talk to. As you can see, and we, Nan and I and the kids have a picture with Jerry Ford when he was president. And also, Kath and I, I think, have a picture also with Jerry Ford someplace in the file. To go out and perform the duties responsible for getting people elected and guiding them along. Basically, the congressional campaign staff came with the professional knowledge of how to run a campaign, how to put it together, how to get it organized, and bring in outside resources. We could tap precinct people that could fly in and organize precincts, which is really beneficial because to turn out the vote and things like this. Didn't know how to mobilize the phone banks, etc. before we had Twitter, and etc. That was uh, really critical. I enjoyed that, flying into Oregon and the ranchers that came in from the outback country there in the state of Washington. And it's just refreshing to meet people from all walks of life 
and I'd spend a few days there helping get organized and leaving the right people in charge so that when I came back 30 days later, I could see what the results are. What are we doing to move this campaign along? And that was great. You'd get reports in from your newspaper people, or the precinct people that you've recruited, whether it's by telephone, uh, by in, for, in person flying in. Mary Ellen Peller was outstanding coming in from Oklahoma on precinct organization. Uh, wow, that's the relationship I had with Jerry Ford and Lee Potter, Ned Terrell, some of the people that were instrumental in bringing in other resources. In the developing apartments, when uh, we finished Governor Reagan's campaign in 1970 to get re-elected as governor, even though I had been invited to go to Sacramento, Mike Beaver and Ed Mays, and then Knopf Sager, it would be nice working with them. What a great team of uh, professionals. And then also Tom Lyce and, and uh, the guys from the Nixon administration wanted to come to Washington. So that's great also. Quite a compliment to be offered positions. But I made up my mind that it did not want to be a political hack. I'd seen guys come looking for jobs in their 50s and 60s that weren't willing to work 100 hours a week. Now, it demands a lot of time to run campaigns. So anyway, we did that and turned, turned them down and started my apartment business at that time. Took a year studying what uh, Ken Nelson, my brother-in-law, and George Archos were doing, and Jimmy Beard in building apartments. Did that, and after a year, I thought I knew enough, and I found the dirt to build 37 units in Costa Mesa, which we still own, uh, Monrovia Apartments. And then, once I got that started, brought Doug Nelson in to run construction operation of it. During the meantime, I've been looking for dirt to build more units. And I found a place over in uh, West Spencer, which we still own, Hollywood Apartments, or we own a percentage of. And all of these projects, we kept a percentage for ourselves, and then we gave the rest of it to the investors to ensure that they made a profit off of it and they would invest in the next project that came along. El Dorado Apartment and Garden Grove under 16 units. We got that started. And then I found the Lincoln Apartments of 98 units and also found the dirt for 184 units in Westminster and also found another project in Riverside, about a hundred and some units out there, 28 units or whatever, 20 units, and we end up selling that to Dr. Charles Hosler, a member of the Lincoln Club, also a friend of Dave Stone's, and then found another project, Riverside, fourplexes, acquired those properties as 120 or some odd units and kept acquiring properties where we got about 1,500 units. And during the meantime, I hadn't shirked the family. I made enough money and bought our first Mercedes and took the kids and went to Europe. Did that. We did another project, did another trip to Europe with uh, my sister-in-law, Ken's wife, and now my ex-wife, bought two Mercedes in, one for Dan and one for uh, Betty Nelson. 
during all the time the kids were getting quite a bit of traveling in Europe, in England, Germany and stuff. So that's also when I was introduced. I was doing all the soccer stuff too. Doing all this and building apartments. Being active in the Lincoln Club. I moved up being president of the Lincoln Club. Doing that. And the Patota Ride was something that happened every year. A lot of guys were cowboys. Some that played to, played out to be cowboys or acted like they cowboys after a couple of shots of tequila and a few beers. We did a lot of that. And it was fun because Porto Ride was pretty incredible that uh, learned cat panning, team panning as such. Bulldogging was so much there that what us was there and that uh, one of the things we did on one of the rides on the Air Grand Ranch, I think it's Fort Shaw who had the farm there and uh, on Knott's Bay had introduced to, to bringing chickens along on the ride where you would bury the chickens in the sand with their heads sticking out, you would ride along at full gallop and lean out of the saddle and pluck the chickens out of the sand. That was fun, except some of us couldn't stay in the saddle. You would lean over so far, pluck the chickens out of the sand. You would end out of, out of the saddle being run over by your own horse. I'll never forget Donnie Oliphant leaned over so far to happen to him plucking the chicken out of the sand or something else. Those were the days. The, you go to sleep in your sleeping bag. One of the first rides it was a uh, kind of a drizzly rain, so naturally you're all cowboys and some of you are sleeping underneath trees and you're sleeping under out in the tall grass, but you're kind of foolishly sleeping in the tall grass in your sleeping bag. Your horse is tied up in the pen someplace with the other horses. Some of the cowboys during the course of the night decided to go riding in the ride through the tall grass. And so they can trample it. Somebody sleeping in the tall grass pretty easily. That was dumb. We had, on occasion, we had to call a helicopter in to evacuate people that were wounded by foolishly riding or doing things. Well, that was something. David Raymond's campaign, uh, he was a poster child from the Vietnam War, six and a half years in the Hoi Nha. I know he helped him. And he, they had encouraged him to run for Congress. And that was 74, which was a disastrous year for the Nixon administration where he resigned. They asked me to head up the campaign. So I did. And Walter Knott's son, two of his grandsons participated in that along with some other in the Lincoln Club. David Raymond was a candidate and he was very patriotic. He wrapped himself in the flag talked about God and country, whereas the opponent of the Democrat, Larry Patterson, talked about business and what he could do for business, small businessmen and women. So he won and we lost. We had a great candidate, uh, but just couldn't keep him focused on business. 
and that's what the business community wanted to hear about. So we lost that campaign. We're still friends. Dave come by, in fact, I'll be talking to him this week. State Building Standards Mission, Governor Reagan appointed me to that. Jim Mills, a uh, Democrat senator, chairman of the committee, was not going to let my point and go through because I was a political guy. And so the governor sent uh, Mike Beaver to the committee to tell him that he wanted me to go through. No offense or buts, no discussion. They sent me through on that. That was the committee because it dealt with the shear panels of the buildings and earthquake, earthquake standards, railings for uh, stairways and patios. And I was privileged to serve with some outstanding people. And Dr. Dagan Cole was the international authority on earthquakes and also on shirt panels. So it's just outstanding to work with somebody like that and share their experiences. And so it's very good, very helpful. Started working with the new, he started this organization called Go Back. And I agreed to head up that operation in California and to introduce people to it. So I did that and got Catherine to work with me on that. That was in 94. Kath and I both, but probably through my role as the, in the Link Club, this is how I met Newt. We got involved there and uh, helped him in formulating some of the data for the contract with America. And so Kath and I participated with the, the callers of Kohler Plumbing, and then Fred Rusacker, and some other people throughout the nation. In Bo Calloway, up in uh, Colorado, in Bo Calloway's place up there, and retreat and everything. So we worked on that for a couple of days. New was a facilitator, and he had wanted to talk about health care. So you talk about that for two or three hours, and then you take a break, then maybe you talk about racism or something, or you would take a talk about trade, or you might talk about the grand car states, or you talk about high tech industry. So he would break it up into those different divisions couple of hours and he would take the notes. It's fascinating. I mean fascinating because his handwriting is so small. And he said take notes. And somebody made good points and Mr. got him say good point or something. Or some opposition to it. He'd do that. So out of all of that, this, I think it's pretty much the basis for contract with America. Take a break, go fly fishing for the Gunderson trout. Great grandfather on my dad's side, I kind of identified it because my mother's side was fired to brimstone in Assembly of God preacher. Oh yeah. So on my dad's side, on the young side, the uh, local town built their first jail house. And they were celebrating the construction of that one room jail house. My grandfather had a little bit too much to drink. He got in a fight with the local marshal. In those days that roving marshals, say, one town, the next, so forth. 
So they put my grandfather in the jail that night because he pulled a knife on the marshal. My grandmother went to see my grandfather that night to visit him with the long dress and the bonnet and everything. So she goes to jail, meets my grandfather for a few hours. He probably took some food with, with her and she left. The next morning, rap on the door and somebody wants to go home. So the jailer opens the door and my grandmother walks out. My grandfather had a cape during the night wearing my grandmother's long dress, bonnet and all of that. Late at night, the jailer was probably asleep. He escaped and he was gone for 13 years. Later on, my grandmother remarried and the grandfather came back, but that's the story of that. My grandfather orange side of family, but on my grandmother's side, they were, we know where they were, they were not fighting with the jailer or anything for the marshal. So that's probably where I got my wild streak in the Marine Corps. Couldn't imagine life without them. They've been so precious, each and every one of them. Eric for his 19 and a half years. Carna Melissa, now McChristian, being part of uh, also the mother giving birth to them. And Catherine working with the children that, that uh, the relationship there has been very good. The burden that uh, the mother carries when somebody's away in business or even so-called business, Portola or boozing with the guys or fishing, uh, they carry a heavy burden in raising the children. So it's Catherine, their generosity and pushing me out the door at times to go fishing and do things with the guy. They've all made a major contribution, each one in different ways. Melissa especially, her strength coming back after Eric's death. Karna and her strength dealing with things. And Kristen and her strength in getting things put together. Gus still working on his strengths. God has been good to us all, especially to me, to have known each and every one of them, and for them to be a, a part of my life. So I can't say anymore. And this is my story.